it gives me a headache thinking about, you know, going back to that time where you just have to really be careful. Um, or I at least thought that I didn't have to be, but that's how I, you know, was thinking in my mind. So I think now I would rather, much rather, a uh, hundred times over, be giving my all to everything I do and, and feel confident in that rather than hiding something because of what other people think or your assumptions or uh, fantasizing that it's going to go negatively. <laughs> Hi everyone and welcome once again to the Sports Pro Podcast. My name is Owen Connolly. I'm the editor at large at Sports Pro. Hope you're well. We have got something a little different and really very interesting for you this time. Ali Krieger is a defender for the National Women's Soccer League side Orlando Pride. She's been capped by her country, the USA, 108 times, picking up a couple of World Cup winners medals along the way. And she's also seventh on Sports Pro's list of the world's most marketable athletes for 2021. This conversation then looks at the question of athletes' commercial activities from a more personal standpoint. Ali lays out her approach to building her public profile, the importance of intent and authenticity in that process, and the values that she and her representatives at Wasserman try to work to on the endorsement side of things. But she also opens up on the effect of huge changes in her personal life in recent years, coming out and her marriage to teammate Ashlyn Harris, motherhood, and the lessons she's learned about the value of being her true self. There's time as well to get into the rise of women's soccer more generally, the US women's national team's ongoing legal battle for equal pay, and the type of game Ali hopes to leave behind for the next generation of players. She's got a fascinating perspective to share, and I do hope you get a lot out of this discussion. More coverage of Sports Pro's 50 Most Marketable Lists for 2021 is available at 50mm.sportspromedia.com. That includes a full breakdown of all the rankings, the methodology, and the data, and what they say about media and marketing right now. You've got the 50 most marketable brands to look out for in the next week or so, and then the most marketable sports properties to follow soon after that. And there'll be lots of ground to cover on each of those, I am sure. For now, though, let's hear from Ali Krieger. This is the Sports Pro Podcast. Ali Krieger of the Orlando Pride and the US Women's National Team, welcome to the Sports Pro Podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to have you here. It's going to be a different kind of conversation from some of the ones that we have, but it's always good to get an athlete on and just reflect on some of the trends that we talk about in the industry and some of the challenges from from a you know a competitor's perspective. Um, mm -hmm. But you're here as well on the back of being in the Sports Pro 50 Most Marketable Athletes list for 2021. You were at seventh and your partner, Ashton Harris, was, I think, at three. Yeah, she was. Mm -hmm. Was that was there any any kind of uh, friendly rivalry or contention <laughs> within the household about that? Well, she thinks she should be number one. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, me coming in at seven, um, you know, I I was definitely um, very. It was very humbling to see that because, um, you know, I think we've we work so hard day to day just with our our job as being professional athletes but then you know building a brand outside of soccer is so important to us and i think we've really tried to um get better at that um throughout our careers and also hone in on that together not only as individuals but then together as a, a couple so it's been really um yeah it's been really fun to see that you know it's it's you know paying off so to speak and so i was i was a bit surprised that we were in the top 10 for sure but um also we have such a great fan base and supporters that um you know i guess we draw a lot of traction uh from them and 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 they, the, their support is obviously what drives um us to continue to do what we're doing both on and off the field yeah yeah and i think the journey that you've been on or the passage of your career is interesting from the point of view of what's happened within women's soccer in that time. Uh, you know, there's been ups and downs in the U S but I think it, the trajectory of it in internationally has been fascinating in the last five, five years, especially yes. probably, 
um, and that's something I'm I'm sure we'll get into. You talked about the, yeah. the work that the two of you have done to uh-huh. to build that audience, build that fan base. How intentional do you think you have to be as an athlete um, to to make that connection with fans, particularly given the tools that you have digitally to do that? Yeah, that's a great, great question. I feel like um, you really have to just be yourself uh, through the whole process and um, not allow the the success and the fame really get to you. I think if you consistently uh, show up as your authentic self, then you attract more and more people. Uh, if you can be really relatable um, and visible. And I think that the connection with fans is really important. So I think over my career, I've always just been myself and really tried to connect with those fans um, to get them to come back and want to come back and bring their friends and family to watch us play. Not only just to enjoy the, the love of the game that we have um, you know, for football, but also and, and just thrive in that passion and to share that at the at the games and in the atmosphere environment, but also um, to to get people to want to put money um, towards women's football and to really keep us on the map. And because if they come once, they're definitely going to come again and they're definitely going to bring their friends and family. So I think, you know, not even thinking about myself or, you know, us as a couple, I've always just been um, you know, uh, authentic and tried to build those connections with fans and really stay after and sign autographs, make the connections, um, you know, act like a normal human being that I am mm. and really try to connect with um, people. And I think that that is something that I feel has really built um, the type of brand that I've wanted to create for myself and um, I do think it's beneficial and has been for us to see, um, you know, the feedback and the support. Uh, so that, that definitely goes hand in hand. And I think that if you can also not only be your authentic self, but number two, um, really fight for, for issues uh, and things that you believe in and really hone in on that and make that known. So using your platform and your voice for good. And I think that if players um, and athletes can do that to connect more with, um, you know, people uh, all around the world, I think that is something that has helped me uh, as a person and individual as well. At at what point in your career did you make that decision? And, and, you know, I mean, social media comes in probably when your career is in its infancy. So is social media. So it's something you've been working with most of the time you've had a public profile but not maybe the entire time but at what point did you say to separate it from the digital side of things that that was a part of your career that was a part of your responsibilities as you saw it yeah i feel like i um really recognize that i have such a great opportunity to use my platform for good and to really share my voice and to be um you know a big part of uh, something bigger than myself, which is connecting with, uh, you know, regular people and and um, people are supporters and athletes and um, fans and you know something bigger than myself and having a good understanding that when you know we have that opportunity to do so, I think it's it's just really important that we take advantage of that and know that not only individually do you have a platform, but then with the team you have a platform and then you know using those platforms for you know you know, bigger beliefs and issues that you can fight for is, is huge. And just to um, make yourself known and make the team known. And I think that's also important. And I think that's what has gone on throughout my career that I've recognized, okay, I can, you know, take advantage of being my own individual, but also I play on the world's highest stage, um, you know, week in and week out. So you have your club teams that you can, you know, continue to use your voice. And then you have the national team platform where you can continue to use your voice. And then as a group together um, on our own individual platforms, then we can also speak out on, you know, issues and beliefs that we want to make known. So Mm -hmm. I think you just recognize that early um, and use social media as more of as a tool um, to fight for good and to fight mm-hmm. for what's right. And so that's something I think we've recognized, like you said, in the past, you know, five, six years, really. Yeah. Yeah. How How is that relationship that you have with social media, with a, a digital audience, how has that evolved? I mean, you, at mm-hmm. what point did you realize 
or at what point did it become something that goes alongside signing autographs after the game, post-match interviews, etc.? At what point did that become a serious part of the mix for you? Yeah, it is serious. I feel like, you know, social media now, before, like, I couldn't be bothered with social media. It's just like, I don't need everyone to know when I'm going to the bathroom and when I'm, you know, going to training. Like, you just, <laughs> like, I don't, that's just to me a bit much. And I also feel like um, social media is kind of, it's good and bad. I feel like there's, it's so amazing to have these platforms to really reach so many people and to have all of our fans and family and friends and supporters really um, be able to kind of see a little bit inside our normal day-to-day -day life and also keep track of, you know, us as athletes and, and um, for them to be inspired um, by us day-to-day by us posting, you know, what we're doing to keep people motivated to just want to get up and be better. So I think that's what the good part of it is. The bad part is also sometimes getting stuck in that world where you're constantly seeing what other people are doing and comparing yourself to those people and those individuals or, you know, um, athletes or celebrities uh, and so on and so forth. And I think seeking validation in other people who you don't even know, more specifically strangers, is sometimes and most times going to be a super negative, unhealthy road to go down. So I feel, I feel like I'm, you know, trying to balance the two um, and not necessarily go on to use it as like a tool to, you know, compare my life to anyone else's, but to only inspire and motivate my family and friends, uh, supporters around the world to just want to be better and to want to inspire and use their voice for good. So you have to kind of make sure you have that balance. And I think that's probably what has been the toughest um, since I think Twitter in 2011, when we were at the World Cup, kind of blew up. Um, and I remember with the team, you know, we're sitting there like, oh, I guess I need to get a Twitter. Like, you know, this is like the new thing. And that was back in 2010, 2011. So that was when we were kind of introduced to social media, so to speak. So it's definitely um, been a great tool for us if you use it in the right way um, and really get people uh, inspired and, and continue to be passionate about what we love to do. I mean, as we said at the outset, the other thing that's probably changed through the course of your career is, is the profile of the women's game. The U.S. national team has been pretty high profile for most mm -hmm. of uh, the last 20 years or so, if not a little bit longer. But the mm -hmm. the club game, you know, you've had the launch of the NWSL where you play. You've had um, launches of different leagues, professional leagues in Europe. You've had various teams giving you a bit more competition on, on the international stage over the last decade. Mm -hmm. What's that been like when you come into a sport that's at a certain level particularly in terms of the commercial profile and the, the audience outside the one you see immediately around you in the stadium. Um, and that kind of hits those new heights and you, you know, you, you have a little bit more, um, a little bit more attention going your way. Yeah, it's really, it's exciting. Uh, of course, because we want everyone to love women's football. We want everyone to love the national team and to love our club teams and to support us and throw money into it so that we can continue to play the sport that we love and, and enjoy and, um, sh you know, show up to work every day. So happy to be there. Um, and I think that's, what's so exciting. You walk out into stadiums where there's 60,000 fans ready to watch you perform on the highest stage and, um, you know, getting to that popularity um, and that fame for the national team or, you know, being on the club team is, has been quite the experience. Obviously, I think that you have to kind of, kind of recognize that, okay, I, I just love what I do so much. Everything else outside of that is great and grand, but I do have to stay consistent with being here at the highest level and how I can do that is what's most important. So it's all great and grand that the, the excitement, the, the fans, the supporters, the, the fame of it all and all the bells and whistles and the, you know, the sponsorships and things like that. It's wonderful. But then, you know, first and foremost, I just love the sport and I love to play football and, and that's why I'm here. And I don't think um, a lot of people, um, you know, who get lost in all of the fame and the, the hype and the, um, you know, sh you know, bright lights, I think really 
like dig deep and remember that it's easy to get to the top, but what's most important is how you can stay there and amongst all of the other noise that's going on. So it's wonderful to see the progression of the women's game because I want nothing more than to turn on the TV and have all of the women's games around the world uh, on, you know, NBC sports and ABC and Fox and ESPN and all the things, um, you know, just where you can flip through and it'd be the, the most popular sport in the world, um, you know, and most watched. But on the other side of things, we can't forget that, you know, at this point with all the shining lights and all the bells and whistles and all the things that we have to stay consistent and be good every single day and, and get better every single day. Um, because you've said before, people are catching up and, you know, there's um, other teams around the world um, who are doing the same and um, going into tournaments now, we're seeing that change and that adjustment, which is all great. Um, but yeah, it's easy to get kind of lost in all of the excitement and the fame. Um, so we have to really dig deep and remember, okay, we're here because we love what we do and we're damn good at it. But how can you say, can, can, how can you stay at this level and be consistently good and good at it? Um, and that's sometimes hard to balance, but I think over the years, um, those who you see that have stayed at the top um, for long periods of time have that figured out um, pretty well. Mm. Is it reflected in the dressing rooms at all that difference in experience and expectation that you have, you know, young women who are coming into the, the teams you play in now who have only known maybe women's soccer at this level, um, mm -hmm. perhaps haven't had the same experience as some of your peers will have had? For sure. I, I do feel like there's definitely an adjustment period for a lot of our rookie players because they haven't been at this level and they're figuring out real quick that, you know, you have to perform at your best every single day just to even get a spot in the 18 squad that travels every trip, you know? So um, that's that's just the reality of it. And, and when we were younger, you know, I wouldn't see the field for, you know, multiple games before I had to perform consistently well in training to get that opportunity to play what like 20 30 minutes in a game uh, at the highest level so you have to kind of work and and improve your worth and um and then you get that reward of being in the squad so there's definitely that adjustment period and then on the other side of things um to be able to like i mentioned before to stay there so being that consistent in order to perform uh, in the squad and get chosen in the squad that game. And then on the other side, okay, now like there's a lot more eyes on me than there was uh, in college or in club when I was growing up. So now I need to be that professional. I need to learn how to stay at this level, be consistent and add to the team, but also, okay, there's so many more eyes on me. So now I have to learn like, okay, I can't maybe do the things that I was doing before, um, you know, I reached this. So it's not necessarily, okay, I'm here and now I'm happy just to be here. It's okay, I'm here and I got to prove myself every day in order to stay here, both on and off the field. And, and how you kind of, a lot of our younger players, how they handle themselves is really, um, you know, the way that they, that they stay at the highest level mentality, but also how to be a true professional. Over the course of the last few years, you've, you've won a couple of World Cups. Um, mm -hmm. You've, with the women's national team, you've become part of a, a huge global brand. Mm -hmm. The flip side of that is that you've been involved in a, a, a court case with your employers for the last couple of years now. Mm -hmm. what's, what's at the heart of that for you guys? Obviously, you know, there's equal pay. You want to be better remunerated you want to have that um yeah. the contribution that you make reflected but is there something that's that's deeper in that in that cause for you yes guys? great question there is something deeper obviously at the surface you see that we are fighting for what we deserve and the immediate uh future and present as actually just in the present we are fighting for for equality and what we deserve and to get paid um, for the job that we do every single day, emotionally, physically, mentally, um, because we endure the same amount as our counterparts uh, within the same and 
environment and the same employer. So that is what is on the surface. And then it goes a little bit deeper than that, that we are fighting for women across all industries, most importantly, um, and other you know, athletes around the world, female athletes around the world that um, are fighting the same battles in their own countries uh, within their own clubs and systems and federations. So I think that going a little bit deeper, we're not just fighting for our team and us as individual players um, against our employer, um, but we are fighting for all women across all industries to really get what they deserve. And so that is probably the deeper fight than just what we usually see on the surface. And I think that's what has inspired me with our team. And what is so attractive about our team is that we can not only connect, fans can connect with any single one of us, but the fact that we come together and we are very powerful in numbers and the way we use our voice. And I think fighting for you know, multiple women and multiple teams and, and, and people around the world is, is really what is the deeper topic. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it strikes me as well that to engage in an action like that, where yes, you're a team who played together a lot, but there'll be people who come into the team, people who drop out of the team. There's a, there's people who have different backgrounds, different perspectives, different agendas, but mm-hmm. you have to throw yourselves into that with a a strong degree of trust and you have to throw yourselves into that with a strong degree you know a a strong kind of collective will i mean how how do you reflect on that what was it what was the kind of process that you came to as a team as a squad to to decide that that was the best course of action yeah, I mean, we're obviously, you know, more powerful in numbers. And so we understand that we are just tired of being treated the way that we were being treated um, and having to overproduce in order to just get paid, um, you know, a, a minimal salary. And so I believe that everybody um, was willing to roll their sleeves up and fight together in order to see a result, whether we see that now or for the younger generations coming, you know, up behind us. I, I think that we're just willing to continue the fight because it's what these players, um, deserve at this level. And so I think that it was just a time that we all were just tired and we were like, listen, we are sick of just getting this and settling, um, that's probably the best word I can say. we never want to settle. We always want to strive to get more and to, um, you know, get paid what, what is deserving of all of our championship wins and our success. Um, and, and that is basically what it boils down to is that we are producing, I should say overproducing day in and day out, um, on all levels, emotionally, physically, mentally, and during all of that. And, constantly producing and winning championships and then still not seeing the benefit of that and the reward. So I feel like that was basically what um, was important for us to come together as a group and say, listen, we need to shout this from the rooftops because it's not okay. Mm. And we need to see change, whether we see that immediate or whether we see that in years to come, we need to keep fighting and the work will never be done. And how much does that attitude transfer in, into some of the other causes that that you guys will, will put yourselves behind whether that's individually or collectively I mean there are several of you there's yourself and Ashton there's also people like Megan Rapino who mm-hmm. not not known for being shy let's let's put it that way when it yeah. comes to, <laughs> to certain causes and again there yeah. has to be a measure of of collective goodwill I guess behind something like that because Mm-hmm. You've, you've got to have faith that that person is still going to be the same person on the field. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, it is tiring, but as, as women, we can multitask very well. And so I feel like uh, we've been able to kind of use this as a tool to motivate us more, um, uh, to continue to be successful, to continue to say, hey, like, what else? do we need to do in order to get paid what we deserve um, in order to f- get the rewards that, you know, we've given to this federation over the years and how much more do we need to do and win in order to just get paid what, um, what we, what we should be getting paid um, as just a player on the team. So I feel like 
it is trust. It is everyone coming together and using their platforms to really speak out and make it known and doing all the things extra off the field in order to then um, use that as fuel to really strive for success and, you know, basically prove day in and day out why um, we're backing ourselves and why we continue the fight. And, and so I do think um, it's, it's crucial that we stick together and that the younger generations who come up in the squad have a good understanding as well, why we fight, what we're fighting for, um, who we're fighting for. And that's just um, definitely year after year, a continuous cycle that um, a lot of the younger generations are willing, um, very willing to uh, help with and, and continue the fight. So that's a good sign. So yes, um, it's a group effort and it's important. And I think just getting the other players um, having a good understanding of the what, why, uh, how, and when is, is definitely huge um, for the group to be um, rewarded in the end. Help us spread the word about the Sports Pro Podcast. Subscribe, like, and share our content on social. Join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag SportsProPod. And if you're enjoying our work, why not leave us a rating and a nice review on your podcast platform of choice. And if you want to get in touch, you can send us an email, podcast at sportspromedia.com. The Sports Pro Podcast, we're listening to. Let's come back to your personal profile. What, mm -hmm. what have you tried to put into that in the last few years you talked a lot about authenticity at the top yeah. there mm -hmm. I think with like I guess coming out as Ashlyn being my partner and then getting engaged and getting married and then um, obviously having a baby I do think that I've opened my private life a lot more than I thought I would over the years but that has even helped me a um, hundred times more than I could have ever imagined. And so that's why I, you know, say that if you live your life authentically, then people are just 10 times more attracted to that than putting something out that's, you know, just um, kind of surface level. I think if you can really connect with people, um, that is what is so attractive Um about making those connections and, and people really following along and, and really supporting you. So for me, what I've recognized is that as I live my life a little bit more open and honest and um, super raw and share more of, you know, what I um, do off the field, I think that has really opened up a lot of doors for me and for us as a family. So I think that is the shift that I saw. Um, not that I never wanted to do that, but I needed to just be okay with the timing of it all kind of happening. And I think once that occurred, then, you know, um, doors started flying open. And so then, you know, when you see two or three open, you're like, wow, like I need to, you know, keep being myself and, and putting myself out there and really show the world who we really are. And you just attract that many more people. So, and sponsorships and, um, it's, it's really enjoyable to go to an event or to go to a game and talk to people and connect with them and them say, Hey, thank you so much for sharing your story because you've helped me and you've saved my life and, or, Hey, you saved my friend's life. Um, because you guys were so visible and open and honest about who you are and what you do and what you love and who you love. And so seeing that is rewarding in itself. And so making those connections, wherever it may be, kind of validates uh, why we wanted to be more visible and as individuals, but also as a family. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's possible that you've answered this already, but what did you learn from that experience of, of coming out and what, what, what surprised you about it? Or was there anything that surprised you about it or any way in which it unfolded differently from how you'd anticipated it? Yes. I learned that our society is becoming a little bit more accepting. Um, I feel like I was, it was going to be a huge risk 
because I wasn't sure if I was going to lose sponsorships, if I was going to get cut from the team, if Ash and I, we play for the same club. So who knows if they were going to re-sign any of us. Um, you know, at the time I wasn't sure if I was going to get fired or, you know, um, for just being who I am, which sounds insane to say that out loud um, in the world that we live in now. But it's still, you know, uh, really difficult to live, um, you know, in a world where, you know, it's not fully accepted. And so there was that risk. And so what I learned is that people are really accepting and people are wanting um, wanting to um, support my family, um, both of us as individuals and then together as a group. And, and they're just so overjoyed. Um, and then a lot of the fans are just so happy to finally see, you know, two women, two female athletes who play soccer on the highest level, but also are married and have a kid and, and are living this normal life are really open and honest and that a lot of fans and supporters can see that they can do that too, that this is, this is normal. Um, and so that's basically what I learned that, you know, a lot of people are accepting. And then obviously, you know, as long as you are visible, um, you know, you're saving people's lives. And I think that if we can all continue to just live authentically, then we attract so much more love and happiness in the world. And I've heard that from, you know, a handful of of people who I've come in contact with about thank you so much for sharing your wedding on on YouTube. And I saw pictures and photos and the video was, you know, this and that, and it saved my life. Um, and that to me was why we're doing what we're doing. Mm. Um, and didn't want to, not that we were hiding, but didn't want to uh, not be willing to take the risk. Yeah. Had, had, had there been people you depended on before taking that step, family, friends, mm -hmm. people within the sport, who, who did you look to, uh, to guide you through that process? Yeah, first and foremost, my brother, um, and also my parents, obviously, um, more so my mom, I think I, um, you know, really talked to them about, you know, this process and what we were planning to do. And, um, and then, um, you know, Ash and I spoke to one of our best friends, Megan Rapino, who we've spoken about, um, and her uh, fiance, Sue Bird, on vacation um, before this kind of, you know, really um, evolved into this whole process. So they really helped us decide, okay, this is something that I think will be incredible and so good for both of you first and foremost and then obviously for fans supporters and, and friends to just like see your life and be supporting it and you know taking the next step to be visible and you know we felt that there's kind of this duty and responsibility that we have as you know public figures to just be ourselves and to inspire the younger generations and also a lot of adults too who reached out and said you know wow like this is amazing you've really helped me come out to my family or to my friends and and so just people in general i feel like it's it's just yeah those were probably the three or four main people who kind of helped us through this process. And, um, you know, Megan and my brother have both gone through coming out um, in their own journeys um, long before Ash and I had done so. So that was definitely a huge um, help for us in kind of having that bouncing board of, you know, talking about, you know, our own journeys and how we wanted to, um, you know, do it. So it's... Um, yeah, it's nice to continue to have that support mm. and to have those people in our corner. Yeah. I mean, LGBT representation is, um, is a, it's a difficult topic in, in football more generally, particularly in the men's game. Yeah. Um, in the women's game, perhaps mm -hmm. a little bit less so, but in the men's game, it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a very difficult subject for reasons that are complicated and the situation as you say might be better when more people step forward but it it's hard to say until they do but do you feel any additional pressure as an ambassador for a community or is that kind of offset by the fact that as you say you are being genuine and you are just just living your as yourself 
um, yeah, in your own life? Good question. I, I feel like um, a bit of both. I feel like, listen, I'm just maybe I, I was always living my life um, and maybe my friends and family just knew uh, of, you know, me having a relationship with Ashlyn, which was fine. And, um, but I do feel like I had a sense of responsibility to, to really, uh, show who I really am and, and not feel like I'm hiding from anyone. Not that I really did, but I do think that because, uh, of us, because of our coming out, you're giving all of yourself to everything you do, not just half of yourself or even, you know, a quarter of yourself. I feel like now I'm giving the club everything. I'm giving my family everything. I'm giving my friends everything. I'm giving my teammates everything. I'm giving, you know, um, when I was on the national team, giving the U.S. soccer everything I had. Orlando Pride, the same. So I feel like now, you know, just living your life, you're really giving your all. And it's not just like, oh gosh, I can't post this because, you know, people are going to see this or that, or are they going to question me here or here? Or like, is she going to post that? And we're going to be in the same fit. I mean, it's just like, it gives me a headache thinking about, you know, going back to that time where you just have to really be careful. Um, or I at least thought that I didn't have to be, but that's how I, you know, was thinking in my mind. Um, so I think now, I would rather, much rather, a uh, hundred times over, be giving my all to everything I do and, and feel confident in that rather than hiding something um, because of what other people think or your assumptions or, you know, thinking about like uh, fantasizing that it's going to go negatively. Mm. It's interesting. Another thing that... It, is kept at arm's length you know you're both you you have a child now together um mm -hmm. the understanding of what family means i suppose to athletes mm -hmm. is is changing as people have slightly different public profiles whether that's because of social media or the kinds of coverage that you get or or what have you um mm -hmm. but you know it used to be that family was somewhere in the background and the impact that it has on your life as a professional mm -hmm is kind of not really discussed um mm -hmm. do you feel like that's something as well that that's changing a little bit that the impact of being a new parent um is factored in yeah of course um i do feel like now i'm even a better player a better person a better mom a better friend a better family member in general um and a better human being because of her and that we're sharing her life with the world i feel like, um, I'm more fulfilled and I have, um, just a different perspective on life now. And I think it's a better perspective. I sometimes talk to Ash and say, gosh, what did we do before she was here? Like, did I just sit on the couch and like take naps and watch Netflix? Like, I don't know what, what I was doing all this time because every minute of every day it's geared towards, okay, I'm going to training and then we come home, we're full on moms. Um, and, and my mom's here helping out with, you know, Sloan and, and everything. But I just feel like I have I have more purpose um, playing and being all of those things. Uh, and it's, it's exciting. I felt like, okay, at the beginning, oh gosh, I'm not going to sleep a wink. Like, how am I going to perform? How is this going to affect, you know, my career? How is this going to affect my play? How is this um, going to affect both of us. Like we're just exhausted, but we're doing it. You just got to get up every day and you just do it. And you find time to recover and you find time to, um, you know, get enough energy to, to be motivated to show up to training and, and play games. But I think she does give us that joy and that motivation. And so I, I can say that family has been you know, and adding her to our family has been one of the best things in my life, if not the best thing so far in my life. And I think we've become such better people because of her. And so, yeah, I, I think it's it's added that extra um, push for yeah. us to be even more successful. Mm. Do you feel like the understanding within sport is there of what that sacrifice means of of starting a family? Because 
lots of athletes do. I mean, male athletes, female athletes. And as I say, it's kind of something you might get a news line or two on it or nice, nice words in an interview, but people don't maybe think about what impact that has on your life, um, yeah. psychologically, emotionally, and in terms of, of your priorities. Yeah, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge um, addition and it's a huge sacrifice. And we knew that, you know, talking about adopting and, um, you know, starting a family. But I do think that it's important um, that people can have both and can be happy having both and can thrive having both. And you can be the best footballer out there and still have um, a family that's thriving and um, successful. And so I do think athletes might hesitate towards that, but it can be done. And I've seen multiple moms on our national team just, you know, have the best careers and also be the best moms. And so I think they've all have inspired us to want to do the same. And so every day we wake up trying to, you know, yes, be the best person we are and the teammate and the mom and the friend and all the things. Um, but, you know, most importantly, to just keep our family together and to keep thriving and um, in a positive direction. And um, I think we are just doing every day and wherever that takes us is, is what's going to happen. But we know that um, with the love that we have for each other and for our child, um, we will be okay. So I think that if people are hesitant about it, um, you know, it's, it's a shame because you are able to do both and you are able to be good at it. You just have to start somewhere. Where does um, the profile that you're creating, that you're sharing with, with fans, where does family mm -hmm. factor into that? Where does your partnership with Ashlyn factor into that? And, and how important is it that when you're working with brands, you're mm -hmm. able to make it a part of that? Yeah, you somewhat have to keep it separate because at the end of the day, we are individual people, mm -hmm. right? And then, um, so we have our individual brands and then we have our brands, our brand together. And then, you know, Sloan has um, an Instagram account that was kind of a joke at the beginning that we were just like, oh, let's just throw up like little outfits on there and like see what happens. Well, now she has like, almost 60,000 followers. So that was maybe not the best idea from the start. But um, all jokes aside, I feel like as individuals, we have to make sure that we stick to who we are as, as people and not, um, you know, compete in that way, but complement each other um, or complete each other, but complement each other. That's something that's really important to us, um, both as in a relationship and then um, you know, building our brand. So that's a really good question. And I think, um, you know, we always want to make sure that we are never defined by just being footballers, that we also have other things um, that we are attracted to and that we believe in and that we fight for um, outside of football that, you know, fans might follow us for as well. Um, and they might not know anything about soccer. They just are, you know, uh, relating to us in a way that, you know, we're, because we're fighting for, you know, other things off the field. So I feel like we have to really make sure that we don't lose sight, that we are individuals first and then um, partners and, and wives and then family. And so I think that that is really important. I think we do have a good side of that. And I feel like with good communication and um, you know, having that confidence and trust that we're doing the right things, but also it's important not to compete with your partner uh, and your family members. I think that that's something that we've had to really, um, I think we're just naturally wanting to shine each other's light brighter. So I don't think it's ever been, been an issue, but I think, um, you know, two athletes who are, you know, on a similar stage day in and day out, that's something that I think can, um, possibly cause um, havoc within uh, a family, but we haven't allowed that at all. So um, it's been really, really nice to kind of shine each other's light brighter and really, um, you know, have that impact in each other's lives to really support and to um, push each other to be better every day as individuals, as a couple, and then obviously as a family. And when you're working with 
partners, brand partners, you and your mm -hmm. representatives. How how do you structure those conversations when you factor all this in that we've been talking about for the last kind of 15, 20 mm -hmm. minutes about your life and, and the, the changes that you've made in terms of uh, how you live your life and how you want to be presenting yourself to the world in the last few years? Yeah, you want to make sure that you're just, you're obviously what we spoke about before, you're just authentic and you really are, um, believe in the issues that you really want to fight for and, and really make that known. I feel like if you just say yes to everything, um, then you're really opening yourself up for, I just feel like it's really hard to fight for every single thing um, because I don't think I can be passionate about every single thing and really make a difference uh, in that one thing. So if I'm really um, honing in on, um, yeah, let's say just for example, I don't know, childcare or youth soccer or fighting for equality, um, just just for an example, like I don't want to say yes to every single thing out there. Instead, I can really focus on these three things and really try to be a small puzzle piece in a, in a small zone of those three areas and really focus in on that um, instead of maybe a broad, a broad, uh, I don't know, range of, of foundations or, um, yeah, just issues. Uh, so to speak, um, that you fight for. And, and I think that if you can really make it known, because Ash and I fight for different things as well as long, as well as together, you know, we're just, um, like I said before, wanting to make sure we stay as individuals and then together as a group. But it's really important to kind of um, understand what you like to do, what you're attracted to, what you believe in, and then try to find those avenues and really stick to that instead of saying yes to everything. Um, it's okay to say no sometimes because that just shows your passion for the things that you really are specific about mm. and believe in. Mm. And has that affected not just the the identities of the brands that you might work for the work with, sorry, the individual companies, but also the kinds mm. of partnerships that you're interested in yes. being involved in and how they're structured, what 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 might be what they might be built on. Right. I feel like our values have to align me as an individual or us as a couple. And then our values within, you know, the sponsorship or the partnership, they need to align um, before I say yes to something and, and put my name, you know, connected with a brand or a sponsor. I feel like that's really key. Um, and, you know, making sure that sponsorships and brands understand that when I do say yes, this is something that I actually am really passionate about and that I believe in. Um, and you can't fake that. Uh, so, you know, there's times where I have, I've said no, because maybe our values aren't aligned or, you know, maybe they're not LGBTQ friendly um, or, you know, you have to kind of do your research research as well with sponsorships and brands and make sure that, you know, your values are similar and that you really believe in it or people aren't going to buy whatever you're trying to sell because it's just, it's easy to see that, you know, okay, she's not really, they don't use this day to day or they're not passionate about it or the way that, you know, she's speaking about it is not really, you know, connected with her um, brand as an individual. So it's really important that our agency understands that um, and what we believe in and then having our core values as individuals and then as a couple, because they won't present anything to us that's not really fitting with mm -hmm. our brand. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have a personal test or anything like that? Any kind of barometer or mark that you think, or is it is it an instinctive thing? Does it come through conversations with, with the agency, with, um, you know, with people close to you? How, how do you go about deciding on that? Yeah, it's an indistinctive thing. I feel like if, um, you know, I, I feel like open um, at times to, you know, research the brand if I don't know, you know, much about it, if I don't want to attach my name to it. Um, I think it's important to do that research in order to say yes or no. Um, and also just to make sure that they are um, a brand that, you know, want that believe in the same things or similar things and, and that we align with them, um, you know, regarding, um, our lifestyle 
and that's also important. And so, yeah, it's definitely in indistinctive, but um, or instinctual, excuse me. But our our agent and um, you know managers within the agency really help to kind of you know kind of weed those those sponsorships or brands out that might not really fit mm. we, because we do have trust in them that they're going to present brands and sponsorships to us that really make sense and that fit with us and that we would agree to. Yeah. Is there anything you're particularly proud of that you've done in the last couple of years that you perhaps, you perhaps wouldn't have done before or that, that, that was an experiment or that was a different way of doing things? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm proud about being a mom and, and going through the adoption process. That's first and foremost. Um, brand wise, um, I'm, I'm, I don't know if there's something that I, you know, would have noticed that I'm more proud than anything else. Um, I think over the years, I was really proud of the ESPN body issue. That's something that um, I, I was really excited about because it's super honest and raw. And um, it was through a time that I um, was trying to work on, you know, being a bit more vulnerable than um, I, I used to be. And so I think opening up and, and showing my true self in that um, issue, that was something that was, uh, I was, a, that was a proud moment for me. I think Vol Volkswagen is, a, is another proud moment for me because it's connected with the national team. And I think that they're such an incredible sponsor and for such a you know global brand to want to partner with me um, being on that stage and um, also having a connection with Germany. And I think that was, that was another proud moment um, for me as, as an individual as well. Mm -hmm. What comes next? What's um? What are you thinking about over the the next few years on and off on and off the pitch? Yeah, I mean, I I'm involved in so many things right now, trying to figure out what I want to do, maybe, um, and not wait till the last minute uh, that I retire to to start thinking about what's next. So I've been um, in my coaching course, my B course uh, for U.S. Soccer, and um, trying to figure out if I really enjoy that. I'm doing analyzing and broadcasting for the men's team here in Orlando. I'm also kind of working with ESPN on the side, just, um, you know, I did through the Olympics. Uh, so that was really fun. Um, I'm coaching a couple nights a week, um, with, uh, a team. So that's a great, and then playing. So I, I have to figure it out. I'm going to continue to just dabble in a few things. And and then most importantly, just continue being the best mom that I can be and the best wife I can be. Because at the end of the day, that's um, what's most important to me and, and my pr first priority. So I think really having fun with Sloan and watching her grow up has been such a joy for me and, and Ash. And so we're going to continue to do that. Um, and just spend time, quality time when we can with our family. Mm. Do you feel like you've got a different set of options from the players who were coming to the end of the, their careers when you were starting in the game? Do you think you've got a better chance of creating something for yourself? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've seen some of my former teammates kind of struggle after retirement, and I obviously know that that's okay. And the, that's a process that I'm probably going to have as well, eventually. And so I just want to make sure at this time that I'm really um, working really hard to try and figure out what I actually love to do and, and something, another passion that I really want to pursue. So I do feel like um, watching and and seeing some of those former players go through that process i've learned along the way um and, and tried to get ahead of the game um early on rather than wait till the last minute so you know not not that it's better or worse the way that anyone does it because everyone has their own journey and their own process so um there's no judgment there but i just me for myself personally um i've chosen this and to kind of do a lot right now and and kind of figure out what path I really want to take. And I think it's important to have a better understanding than, than for me, um, wait till the last minute. Mm. And how, how would you hope the game changes for the, the women who are coming behind you? I hope the game changes in a way that they can just play the sport that they love and do the job that they love to do and not have to worry about all the other things 
because right now outside of soccer, I make a lot more money than I do playing and, and just in my normal job day to day. So I hope that a lot of the younger girls, which is what we're trying to fight for day in and day out now, that they can just show up to work, do their job and retire by doing that job and not retire and then have to think about the next thing and the next job that they're gonna have to do for another 30 years. So it's really important um, that we continue the fight because that is what I am hopeful for the younger generations to just play at this level, enjoy it, have fun, do their job and do it well, and then be able to retire and have a beautiful life. Ali, thanks very much for your time. Thank you, I appreciate it. Sports Pro Podcast is published by Sports Pro Media. The producer is Ed Dixon.